Well, welcome everyone um, to the start of our uh, annual mid-year meeting here in downtown Los Angeles. You know, part of the theory of our moving this meeting out of Washington is that ASIL can come to learn about a region of the country. And one thing that Betsy and I learned in coming to Los Angeles is that it's a very big city. <laughs> and uh, that to somehow have a program in Los Angeles is not merely to be up at UCLA, um, but to also be here downtown. And we really appreciate uh, the time down here as well. Now, there are many people to thank uh, over these next days and a half. Um, but what I particularly want to do tonight, uh, being downtown, is thank the law firms of uh, Los Angeles that have supported us. And in particular, that's uh, Gibson, Dunn, and Crutcher, and their partner, Scott Edelman. Milbank Tweed, uh, with Michael Nolan in Washington, D.C., and Alan Marks here in Los Angeles. And Munger, Tolls, and Olson, with their partners, Charles Siegel, Joe Lee, and Manuel Chacon. Um, and then I really want to thank, in particular, Aaron Fox, which has been given a tremendous amount of generosity, both in support and in the time of its uh, partner in charge, who is Robert O'Brien, which leads to a transition to our panel this evening. Um, Robert, um, it's a delight to introduce Robert. Um, you know, often we hear the phrase about a great American, and I think Robert is really an example of that. Robert is currently a member of Mitt Romney's Foreign Policy and National Security Advisory Team. He is co-chair of the U.S. Department of State Public-Private Partnership for Judicial Reform in Afghanistan. Those two things are a little bit in conflict. <laughs> so uh, as, as uh, Robert was just mentioning, he'll be transitioning out of the uh, Department of State position, which uh, he had been planning to do for some time in any event. He's had that for a while uh, and continuing in his role with Mitt Romney. He has served in the past as the U.S. Alternative uh, Representative to the U.N. General Assembly. And uh, over a decade ago, uh, we both worked together at the U.N. Compensation Commission in Geneva. And that was a particular pleasure, given that Robert um, I, had, I have the pleasure to say was my student. So it's nice to bring this all back uh, in our community circling around. And I will turn this over to Robert to lead tonight's panel discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, David. I'll just sit here. There's, we'll get up to the podium. Uh, I, I sure appreciate David's kind words. Uh, he's uh, not just my uh, former professor, mentor, friend. Uh, uh, he's become a great friend of my family's. Uh, he said we worked together at the UNCC. That's generous. I actually worked for him. He was a commissioner. I was staff. Uh, so uh, that was nice. Uh, welcome to uh, Los Angeles and welcome to the California Club. I hope you're enjoying the weather if you're from the East Coast. I always know when the weather's turning in the East Coast because we have more of our partners from New York and Washington visiting the LA office. Uh, for some reason, business development in LA is always best between November and March. Uh, so uh, welcome, uh, welcome out. W we've got an all-star panel. Uh, tonight, no one up here uh, needs any introduction. Uh, in fact, it's the, the type of panel, I, I, I brought my son, just to digress for a minute, to uh, a panel that I served on. And afterwards, he came up and asked, and he said, hey, Dad, uh, he's 14. He goes, uh, those guys on the panel were all smarter than you. And, uh, I said, yeah, they were, they were. And he goes, and they went to really good schools. Uh, and I said, yeah, they, they, they did. Uh, thanks, I'm glad I brought you. I'll make sure I bring you to court. Uh, next time I have an <laughs> argument, uh, but but I feel that way uh, this evening. Uh, I'll, I'll start with uh, Dean uh, Edward uh, Swain from George Washington University. Uh, he'll speak to us regarding the Hague Convention on uh, Choice of Court Agreements. Uh, he's the Senior uh, Associate Dean for Academic Affairs, Professor of Law, Director of the uh, Competition Law Center, and has one of those uh, amazing CVs that you only see at an ASIL uh, convention or meeting like this. Uh, Editor-in-Chief of the Yale Law Journal, law clerk to Judge Rubin on the Fifth Circuit, antitrust practice with Cleary in Brussels, stint at uh, DOS in 0506 when I was there, uh, uh, and widely published in uh, all the right journals. So we're, we're thrilled to have him uh, uh, speaking on a, on a key topic, and I think the, the questions are going to be pretty interesting, uh, uh, given how uh, 
tough it is these days to get a, uh, a convention or a, a treaty passed through the Senate. Uh, as an aside, I do want to thank uh, him uh, uh, and his university. George Washington hosted uh, one of our Afghan scholars last year. He came over and received an LLM degree, uh, Fahim. Uh, it was a, a very, very generous uh, full scholarship uh, for this young man, but uh, something uh, very sad happened in January. I had just returned from a trip to Afghanistan with a, uh, uh, a group that we'd taken down there, and we found out uh, that Fahim's sister, uh, uh, her name is uh, Hamida Burmaki, uh, and is a prominent women's rights activist in Afghanistan, uh, was killed with uh, her husband, her three children, and her son in a suicide bombing uh, randomly at a grocery store not too far from where I'd just been at a meeting a, a few days earlier. Uh, and so Fahim was here. He couldn't get back uh, in time for the funeral, which was conducted in, uh, uh, with respect to their religious traditions in a relatively prompt manner. Uh, and uh, Dean Carmenian uh, at George Washington University stepped up and took care of this young man, uh, got him through uh, a very difficult crisis, and. Uh, uh, he graduated and received his LLM degree, and uh, uh, I want to do uh, to thank him again and his university for their, uh, not only for their uh, generosity in bringing a scholar over, but for their humanity and, and the way that they dealt with him after that tragic event in his family. Uh, and it, and the, the interesting thing is we, the State Department was prepared to allow Fahim to stay and give him uh, uh, status here, resident status here. Uh, he decided to go back to Afghanistan to try and rebuild the country. Uh, which is uh, courageous, but also I'm sure he was inspired by what he learned at the, uh, at the university. Following uh, Dean Swain's comments, we'll take a couple of questions from the audience, uh, and then we're gonna hear from uh, Donald Francis Donovan and Lucy F. Reed, uh, again, two people that don't need uh, any introduction, especially in this uh, group. Uh, they'll have a conversation in which we, this is a small group, so we hope to uh, involve the audience and, and ask a lot of questions, interrupt them, uh, throw, you know, be a live panel, throw questions at them uh, in the middle of their, uh, their conversation because it's designed to be informal and they'll talk about uh, some of the hot topics that we're facing in international arbitration. Uh, Donald Donovan, of course, is a senior partner at uh, Deb of William Plinton. He'll be the uh, president of the ASIL when uh, uh, David Karen steps down in March. Stanford law grad, uh, Blackman clerk, preeminent commercial uh, international arbitrator. Uh, but he's also dedicated his life to human rights and has received uh, numerous awards and served on boards of human rights panels and, uh, and has shown a commitment to, uh, to, to that side of uh, international law and, and uh, shown his humanity uh, as well. Uh, Lucy F. Reed, uh, of course, is a New York office at Freshfields, uh, co-chairs probably the preeminent international arbitration practice in the world powerhouse uh, firm in that area. Uh, <laughs> Uh, and in addition to her practice, she's also been involved in public international law, has served as a commissioner of the Ethiopia Eritrea Claims Commission, uh, the Tribunal for Dormant Accounts in Switzerland. Uh, she was also at DSF, or excuse me, DOS for a time, and was GC at the Korean Peninsula Development Organization. Uh, she's an honors graduate uh, from the University of Chicago School, so uh, law school. So it is, it's a great panel. I think we're going to hear some interesting things this evening. And uh, with that, I'll turn the time over to uh, Dean Swain. Uh, thank you very much for uh, that uh, kind introduction. Uh, thanks to ASIL for including me uh, mistakenly uh, on such an august uh, panel, uh, and as I'll say in a few minutes for uh, involving me in the project that I'm going to describe to you. And also thanks, Robert, for those kind words about um, Susan Karamanian, um, our international law dean, who just uh, who does a wonderful thing for uh, our, uh, our university, and she just celebrated her 10th year with us. Uh, and we uh, wouldn't be the place we are uh, without her. So thanks for those, those kind remarks. Um, so I am, relatively speaking, a newcomer uh, to uh, international uh, commercial law. That's not really uh, my expertise, as you'll rapidly expose in your uh, questioning. Um, but the problems um, that we were trying to address with this convention uh, weren't unfamiliar to me as somebody who uh, teaches uh, contracts law and the CISG and so forth. The basic scenario, for those of you who aren't familiar with the convention, I won't suppose that you all are, um, is you know, suppose you have uh, a contract between parties uh, from different states uh, and uh, something goes awry. Um, the parties become antagonistic towards one another, as they sometimes mistakenly do. Um, one thing that might happen is that the parties might retreat to their respective corners, uh, file lawsuits, and a court will have to decide uh, which of those two courts will proceed, or perhaps both will. Um, 
Another possibility is the two might cooperate to some degree uh, in choosing a particular uh, jurisdiction um, and then um, produce a result that, unbeknownst to one of them, is a stunning victory uh, for the other. Uh, and then uh, they may uh, decide to cease cooperating and there will be some difficulty in enforcing the judgment. The judgment remains to be collected. Uh, and uh, the lawyer facing that situation would presently come to the stark realization that there is no effective international system um, for requiring states to heed one another's jurisdiction uh, or judgments in these sorts of situations. Lawyers know this, of course, so what do they do? Um, they can solve the problem to some degree by writing a contract that has a choice of courts uh, provision in it. Um, they have to hope that it's enforceable if it's challenged, uh, and they still have the problem of pursuing uh, the judgment. Everything's possible, but little is certain in that circumstance. There's really no degree of certainty they might have. Um, alternatively, they can agree to arbitrate the matter, uh, which um, uh, I understand to be a lucrative uh, pursuit uh, uh, for, for many of them, and quite efficient in many regards. Uh, and here they have a major advantage. International law affords them a leg up uh, because of the 1958 uh, New York Convention, um, which the US has ratified in 1970, and which has um, started a process that has unfolded um, by which states can mutually agree to enforce uh, arbitral awards. Um, so this creates, however, a regulatory gap uh, between um, choice of courts agreements uh, and agreements uh, to arbitrate, and international law abhors a vacuum. Uh, and so international law has been trying to figure out uh, how to deal with this, um, to have a similar convention, say, for courts that would allow uh, parties um, to have really an opportunity to choose on a level playing field uh, between whether they want judicial resolution on the one hand or arbitration on the other. Um, and the U.S. has a particular stake in this. Uh, the U.S. courts have been relatively open uh, to entertaining lawsuits and also to um, relatively amenable uh, to foreign country judgments. Uh, and so the issue from a U.S. perspective has been more or less how to persuade um, others to permit successful U.S. litigants. And by that I mean people who have litigated successfully in U.S. courts, not necessarily U.S. parties, um, how they can achieve uh, similar rights abroad uh, to pursue uh, their judgments abroad. Um, so the Hague Conference took an interest in this uh, at the behest of, of many, uh, and in the early 1990s tried to establish a convention on the recognition and enforcement of judgments generally. Um, this was eventually retooled, however, into a subset. Um, the theory of this being that agreements were a much more tractable problem because there you had the parties in principle, opting into whatever peculiar civil procedure a particular jurisdiction might have. They were agreeing to be subject to it. Uh, and uh, contract disputes seemed uh, more, uh, there seemed to be more common ground. So eventually this broader enterprise uh, kind of ground to a halt. Uh, and this newer, smaller convention, the Convention on uh, Choice of Court Agreements, arose. It was concluded in 2005. Basically it has um, three rules, more or less. Uh, one of them is uh, that a court in a uh, treaty party state that's chosen by the parties uh, has to hear their dispute. A second is the court in a treaty party state that's not chosen, this is, a, this is one that is not privileged by the parties, uh, has to stay out. Uh, if a party files in that state, notwithstanding the agreement, uh, the court says, stay away. You chose somebody else, I was spurned, uh, I want nothing to do with your suit. Um, and the third component is that a judgment that is rendered pursuant to one of these choice of courts agreements, um, uh, an exclusive one at least, has to be uh, entertained. It has to be enforced by other treaty parties. Uh, and there is also the option of having non-exclusive choice of court um, uh, provisions enforce judgments rendered according to them in this way. It leaves out a lot of nuance, this, uh, this description. Um, not all contracts are covered. Consumer contracts, for example, are excluded. Um, and there are some traditional safeguards that are included. Um, for example, um, you can ignore a choice of court uh, agreement judgments um, that are manifestly incompatible uh, with the public policy of the requested state. Uh, and other things that are hot button issues like um, non-compensatory damages, for example, uh, can be excluded. Um, and states also have some latitude to um, reduce the coverage of the convention if it's ill-suited to their local politics. For example, they can dictate um, that they won't have anything to do with exercising jurisdiction over uh, no-contact cases, 
so they can say if the, if the dispute has nothing to do with us, uh, that's not covered by the convention. This is one of the options they have to make such a declaration. So um, this sounds great uh, in principle, and the U.S. Uh, uh, upped for this. It signed the convention in 2009. It solves a problem that the U.S. Uh, uh, wanted solved uh, and enjoys uh, bipartisan support. So what exactly is the problem? Um, most basically, it concerns a question about how the convention is going to become part of U.S. law. Um, uh, the quid pro quo for everything that we're trying to achieve abroad is that we actually get our act together um, to make this meaningful uh, on our home front. Um, and there are three basic options here, as is as, as usually the case. Um, you could treat it as self-executing, in theory, um, as automatically part of U.S. law. That's almost certainly, in this case, a bad idea. Um, because the convention was written um, in a consensus procedure that means that a lot of it is somewhat vague. Not vague bad, but uh, it requires to have some more meat on the bones, I would say, um, than is um, immediately uh, useful. If you were to just throw this into um, a state court, for example, a lot of the terms don't resonate, uh, and so it requires some degree of translation. As a second option, you could adopt a federal law, a statute to implement the convention. That's the usual course of events, and that's what we did uh, with the um, New York Convention on Arbitration. We adopted a federal statute. Uh, the third option uh, is you could implement it by state law with some safeguards, uh, providing for federal preemption if the states fail to do their part. Uh, and um, what that means to be a failure is part of the con controversy. But um, you can accelerate state adoption through a uniform law process, through the Uniform Law Commission. Um, and they have some experience with doing this, with uniform um, Foreign Judgments Money Acts. Um, there have been a couple of these that have been somewhat successful. So um, there have been some division of views as to which of these uh, routes uh, is preferable and uh, how either one would be handled. Um, and to describe the situation before um, I arrived on the scene, uh, the newcomer uh, uh, wandering into this somewhat unwittingly, uh, it seemed to me that in, the, um, in their enthusiasm for the convention, um, various parties had uh, laid a lot of track already, uh, trying to develop how this would be implemented, but the track was of different gauges, you know, uh, and it went to different destinations completely. And so everyone was excited about the idea. They wanted the train to come, but how that train would operate and where it would wind up was completely different, and there was a lot of infrastructure. Um, so why couldn't the State Department, my initial question was, just choose, just decide which is the better railroad uh, that's been uh, developed to this point and just opt for it? Um, I think this gets down to ultimately the harsh realities of the contemporary treaty uh, process. Um, the only treaties that are getting through are those in w that are uh, uncontroversial. And so um, if um, somebody who is enthusiastic about the treaty could say, well, <coughs> yes, it's a good treaty, but this is decidedly second best as a way to implement it, that would probably be enough uh, to scuttle it. So um, what do we do about this? Um, ASIL tried to assist in this process. Um, and in 2010, it formed this working group that I'm, a, that I'm privileged to be a part of. And um, it brought virtually everybody to the table. Uh, it brought representatives from the ULC, uh, representatives from the American Law Institute, representatives from the State Department, from the Legal Advisor's Office, uh, representatives from the Justice Department, uh, and um, to my enormous surprise, when we brought all these talented people who knew a great deal about domestic implementation and also about the Hague Conference into one room, to my enormous surprise, we didn't wrap up everything uh, immediately at once. Um, at the conclusion of these meetings, um, these initial meetings, some still thought that the Grand Central Station was in Topeka, Kansas. Um, some uh, thought it was uh, in Washington, very near Foggy Bottom, uh, and few thought it was in New York, uh, and so we had to keep going. Um, so what did this accomplish? Well, first of all, I think that ASIL was able to bring everyone into the room. Um, David uh, and Betsy um, were able to persuade a lot of very busy people um, that all was not lost uh, and that we could uh, actually work together. Now, Harold Coe was very helpful, of course, in doing this as well, um, but for a variety of reasons, 
um, the State Department couldn't really be the organizing party, couldn't be the convener. Uh, and um, I think ASA was instrumental in uh, bringing this, this new kind of advisory process, this mini think tank on the convention together. And uh, I think it, it did a world of good as a consequence of that. Um, beyond actually bringing people into the room, uh, and for the most part, everyone has emerged from those rooms as well. A few fatalities, but uh, they haven't been written up. So, um, you know, we've actually made enormous strides <coughs> in actually forging a compromise approach. Um, the approach, which I'm happy to entertain questions about, is just an, uh, a uh, cooperative federalism one. Um, and um, how we do that has um, been quite uh, complicated. Um, and uh, the idea is, though, at the end of the day, um, that foreign litigants and uh, parties who are interested in, in adopting the convention themselves will be able to look to state law and federal law and see roughly the same thing. Now, there are complications to this, and we're really working on some very difficult to resolve issues, including where they'll be enforced. Um, but I think uh, I'm going to guess uh, that the paper suggests that I might wind up at this point. Um, Oh, says so, 50 that's minutes. Minute. That's a five minutes. Says five 50, minutes. 50 minutes. <laughs> You're being too, 50 minutes, excellent. So, um, well thus emboldened, um, uh, I, will, uh, I will say to some degree that I think uh, ASIL has been, in this respect, somewhat the victim of its own success. Um, if nothing had been accomplished within this working group, um, Everyone would probably walk away from it and say, well, it was a waste of time, but I was true to my ideals. Uh, I had low expectations, and they were met. Uh, and as we emerged blinking into the light, uh, people, third parties would say, well, yeah, I told you so. Um, and instead, I think what we're seeing, and this is a difficult process of compromise, I think what we're seeing to some degree is uh, people, not unlike having buyer's remorse, looking at what has been agreed to, what we've been, the parameters within we've been working, and saying, hmm, did I really agree to that? Is this really, how's this gonna play um, with my constituencies? And, and uh, third parties are reacting divergently. And so one of the issues, for example, is whether this is um, a federal question that gets uh, resolved in federal courts, like the arbitration. Um, and um, or alternately, it's something that can be hashed out in all state courts and uh, and bring, brought into federal courts only through diversity jurisdiction. Uh, or perhaps there are some removable issues. Uh, and uh, as we've uh, begun to sort of flesh out what that means, a variety of interested parties, federal and state judges, members of the private bar, have all weighed in. And now we're at the process where we have to reconcile all these new views um, to what we have sort of been talking about within the group. And this is a very difficult process, and we're not home uh, by any stretch of the imagination. But I really do think uh, that we've made some progress. And in a weird way, the progress that, we, that we've made has put in relief the remaining difficult questions. You couldn't see these as acutely before when what you're dealing with was two completely different texts operating in their own worlds. Uh, and now I think what we've done is actually isolated uh, and uh, force ourselves to confront some very difficult questions. Um, but I really credit the process uh, for at least putting us in this position. So I will close there. All right. <coughs> Excuse me. Thank you. I had uh, questions from the floor. Well, well, you know, is there any hands? I, I'll throw one out just to, to get started, but then I, I expect help. Uh, because I'm not going to moderate this on my own. David Karen <laughs> promised me that uh, there'd be audience participation here. Uh, look, it, it, it's a tough environment to get any, and you alluded to this, to get any treaty uh, through the Senate at this point, uh, whatever the implementing mecha mechanism is. Yes. Uh, what are your thoughts about this treaty? What, what's controversial about, controversial about it? What's going to keep senators from, from voting for the treaty? Uh, how is it going to become a partisan issue? Well, in principle, it ought not be at all partisan. Uh, in principle, uh, it, it's really amazing the degree of support that at least I've perceived for the treaty <coughs> itself. The point of potential controversy has been the mechanism for its implementation. Uh, and uh, the, the difficulty is, unavoidably, that we uh, are, through international processes, 
intruding in something that has been left to the states uh, and to state courts, to very experienced, proficient practitioners who think that it's worked reasonably well and don't want to see it wrenched out of the courts. Uh, and it's also been part of this uniform law process in the past, and it's been the, something the federal government's backed off of. So the fundamental problem has been trying to, um, to, to marry that world with a world in which there is a federal interest in um, adhering to our treaty obligations, as we imagine they will be, uh, and to ensuring sufficient uniformity to persuade other people uh, to sign on to the convention as well. Um, and the way that's manifested itself in potential political opposition is if we federalize this entirely, I think it's anticipated that there might be resistance from people who say, well, look, this has worked reasonably well through state processes. This is an example of uh, Washington trying to run the country. If everything is put in federal courts, um, there will be a certain number of judges who will say, we're overworked, we can't manage the docket as it stands, please don't add this, state courts are doing reasonably well, to which state judges will say, yes, we are. Um, and so there's a variety of ways this could go wrong, and I think the theory of it is, if there's any kind of opposition or um, a premise that this is second best, this could be scuttled, and you don't want to fight this kind of battle and lose it. Uh, and so I think, understandably, this administration and the last one are fairly risk averse, uh, and so uh, it's almost a zero tolerance kind of situation. Well, I think one of the things that's been done fairly effectively here is to bring in um, really quite uh, diverse constituencies uh, who don't see the world the same way, uh, and I think really have participated in this as kind of a, a leap of faith uh, in uh, the society and its ability to cope with it. So to some extent, we'll see how this works uh, as, as a proof of concept in some regard. Um, I actually think I'm pretty optimistic about the process, and I think that in future instances, we won't necessarily have to be addressing a problem that's as intractable as this one. I think the difficulty with this situation is we have fairly invested efforts, as I was describing, you know, the different gauges of track. Uh, and I'd like to think that, that another one will come along which you won't have this sort of um, set efforts that you'll have to unwrite. Now what I would expect uh, will be uh, a substitute problem, will be your average international convention is more controversial, I think, than this one is. I mean, I think this one has such a degree of support that we're able to get a pass on that front and just work, worry about the domestic front. Um, so I think in a future uh, problem that the society might want to take on through this kind of mechanism, there will be more controversy on the international plane, on that degree of commitment. Um, so I think there'll be some advantages and some disadvantages So thank you for that comment, Ed. I just I would just would follow up that I think Betsy and I have seen other forms that this takes. That in our politicized world, there's it's we need places that are not politicized, and I think ASIL has that reputation and reality. Uh, the addition I would make a, a rather different thing is um, as international law more deals with domestic subjects. State Department is brought into conversations with domestic agencies uh, at the federal level, and often in a position of dominance uh, because traditionally that was their area. And what I have found over that past year in Washington was sometimes the other agencies would approach ASIL about having a program. Is there some way we could get everyone in the room to talk about an issue? Um, this is happening in a number of countries that foreign ministries that dealt with only external matters actually in dealing with external matters are now dealing with internal matters and their scope of contact with domestic agencies are increasing and how to facilitate that. We have official processes but they're, they're also there are games that are played as you well know uh, about this. So there's a number of ways in which I think uh, there are 
ASIL can be a convener and help things move along. So the new president of the ASIL can do the interagency meetings uh, before the interagency meetings. Uh, <laughs> that'll, uh, people will line up for that job. Uh, the, uh, thank you, Ed. Uh, <clears throat> it is amazing that you can pull everybody together. And, and I do think that the reputation of the ASIL uh, in Washington as a nonpartisan, uh, safe organization to have these conversations among experts and professionals, even folks with different views, uh, is critical because the, the, the space in the public forum for having those meetings is getting smaller and smaller. And to the extent that uh, the ASIL can uh, uh, carve out some space there uh, for that sort of discourse is, uh, is really commendable. Uh, and, and we'll have some time at the end for some more questions for Ed, but let me turn the, uh, the panel over to uh, uh, Donovan and Reed right now uh, and hear their take on the hot topics in uh, international commercial arbitration. Thank you. Uh, before uh, I introduce our cutting edge arbitral techniques part of the panel, I have to agree with, with Robert that um, our children keep us honest as international lawyers. And this is a brief anecdote. My son, when he was 13, told me he wanted to be a lawyer for three reasons. He likes to argue, he likes to win, and he likes to fly on business class. <laughs> and one morning at home, uh, I, I, I do mostly, I want you all to understand, I do only incredibly intellectually challenging public international law arbitrations involving treaties and ICJ cases, but occasionally <laughs> I have to do a construction arbitration. And one Sunday morning, my my son was reading the paper, and I was on the phone with some Italian clients saying, yes, okay, claim 903, the bolts in the fertilizer plant were rusted, claim 709, okay, there was a leak, blah, blah, blah. After 25 minutes, I put, put down the phone, and my son looked up at me and said, I changed my mind. <laughs> <laughs> so there you go. It's not all that glamorous. But we... Um, we did want to target, since we're in the city, some issues for practitioners of international arbitration uh, and focus on the, what we call cutting edge, or the topic of cutting edge arbitral techniques to deal with the, the perceived inefficiencies in international arbitration right now, particularly commercial. If you have questions about treaty arbitration, we're, Donald and I both do it, and we're happy to get into it, but we're going to uh, each speak for a few minutes about our, our our top complaints in international uh, commercial arbitration and, and proposed fixes and then open it up. And I'll introduce this by saying that uh, I always challenge people in this discussion, uh, particularly practitioners, about why there are so many complaints, particularly by corporate counsel, about the inefficiency of international commercial and treaty arbitration. Uh, the and my three points are this. In international arbitration, we are not looking for fast and inexpensive half-day results or any return to some nostalgic idea of, of tribal elder justice. We take the big arbitrations that we take uh, to arbitration not to be fast or inexpensive, but because we can't go to the courts uh, in the other country where our clients are doing business and vice versa because to, to revert to what Ed was talking about, we have a lot of foreign clients who distrust the U.S. courts because of triple damages and discovery uh, and juries. 
So it's mutual. So we've got to be in arbitration. And it's not, these are bet the company cases. They're billions of dollars, some of them. So the expectations have to be lowered on efficiency. Second, I think the complaints are exaggerated. Most people are relatively satisfied. And third, but there's much more to be done in this field. And the fixes are not rocket science. They're small things. They're techniques that counsel and clients and arbitrators and institutions uh, can do more about. I will uh, illustrate some of my main points by telling you all, if you don't know, and this is something you have anything to do with, that the ICC, the International, not the International Criminal Court, but the International Chamber of Commerce Court of Arbitration has enacted new rules that go into effect in January. I won't go into all the changes, of course, but some are focused exactly on this question of efficiency and management. One is, and I find this intriguing as a, as a lawyer, the rules now will con contain an explicit contractual obligation between the tribunal and the parties that their arbitration be expeditious. So when it's not, a contract is violated and costs can be awarded by the arbitrators to the parties and arbitrators can be uh, more safely challenged for inefficiency. The ICC has said this is a contract that you will be private givers of justice for us and it should be uh, efficient. Second, there will now be a mandatory case management conference at the beginning, separate from the terms of reference conference or parallel to it, in which the, the arbitrators and the parties have to talk about how to bifurcate, trifurcate the case, have dispositive motions up front, use video conferencing, discuss the ways that it can be more, more efficient. And this should make arbitrators more willing to insist on efficiency by sitting down and saying, to the parties, this is, this is how we will do it. And don't say you're going to challenge my award uh, if we do it this way. Uh, the third, and I like this one, it's very subtle. Now, when an ICC panel finishes a hearing or takes its last submission, they have to give an indicative date of when their award will be issued. I call this the library card phenomena. You know, if you remember when you were young and you took out the library card and it said, this book is due on December 1st. You knew, you knew it was due on December 1st, and it was a big deal if you had to extend it. And that will put, I think, pressure uh, on arbitrators instead of these rolling extensions. And fourth, the arbitrators in ICC cases, and this is my first of my big bugaboos here, now have to say not just that they're independent and impartial before they're appointed, but they're available, that they have time. And a quite legitimate complaint in international arbitration now, particularly treaty arbitration, is the arbitrators say they have time, but then you can't get a hearing date for a year, or awards don't come out in, for two years. I don't think the ICC has gone far enough. Uh, and I have been a proponent publicly of what I call the blackout calendar, which is that the institution should require arbitrator candidates to submit a calendar that shows what dates they cannot be available for hearings or meetings with the parties. And it could be because they have another hearing, because they have their own cases to try, because it's their child's birthday. It doesn't matter. Just when, as of today, freeze frame, will you really be available to take on another case as arbitrator? I have had, <laughs> I have been accosted by Europeans who tell me I'm invading their privacy to even suggest this. I say, I'm not asking what you're doing you know, or why you're not available. I don't care. I just would like to know, really, do you have blocks of time? They say, well, it could change tomorrow. I say, fine. It could change tomorrow. But you should be asked to, just as we have to prove that we've done X number of arbitrations before we're appointed, are you really available? To me, this shouldn't be so, so, uh, so provocative. And then the, the last thing that the ICC rules will be doing is having an emergency arbit arbitrator process. I don't know if that will um, be necessary or not. My, so my first is availability, my first big complaint. The second is unprepared arbitrators. And there are good reasons why we're all unprepared for things in life, and there are bad reasons. OK, I admit it. But I've been a proponent, proponent and Donald's firm has actually done it, of what I call a uh, forced arbitrator retreat, where the parties say to the arbitrators, we will pay you to go away for a weekend and read our briefs four weeks before the hearing. So you can give us questions, tell us if we're off base, tell us what witness you want to hear about. 
Uh, it's really, off the record, it's kind of a lockup rule. Um, and even arbitrators who are generally conscientious would benefit from knowing they're being asked to front load <coughs> preparation. And I learned this in an ICJ case that I did, Liechtenstein v. Um, v. Germany years ago with one of my partners who represented Liechtenstein, and we had the greats, Crawford and Palais and Hefner, and our, my partner made us all go away to a nice hotel somewhere near Dusseldorf, and we would meet for an hour, discuss where the case was going, and then all those people were locked in their rooms for three hours with computers to draft, and then we would come back together, and this went on for four days, and it was the, it's really stuck with me as very efficient use of time. And my last point is this, more dispositive motions, more U.S. practice in international arbitration in this way. In, arbitrators should encourage the parties to right up front pick out issues of law or fact that can be resolved to prune away uh, issues instead of dragging it out to the end. We shouldn't always be thinking sequence, sequence, sequence. We should be focusing on results, a results-oriented calendar. So Donald, you have three additional ones. Yeah, just um, perhaps to start, I, I echo Lucy's preliminary remark, which is when we talk about efficiency, I think we have to be careful not to compare ourselves to some idealized past in which you know, a bunch of folks sat around the table and dispensed justice. The fact of the matter is that these disputes um, that the, the, the arbitra international arbitration system deal with are large. They are important to the parties, whether they're large or not, and they're disputes in which the competing parties are prepared to put some resources. I mean, I think um, that it, it is useful to think about the international arbitration system not as some kind of quick and dirty justice, but instead a, as a transnational justice system that people go to for the reason Lucy said, not because they're thinking that's going to be super efficient or more efficient than a national court system, but that in fact they're going there because they want a neutral forum. And if you think about any international arbitration system and the, the, its structure, its architecture, it really is uh, extraordinary. Effectively, it is a system in which states will put, behind which states will put their coercive authority, even though they do not directly regulate the process. They indirectly regulate it by the conditions on which they will put their coercive authority. But it differs in that respect from either a national court system, which some legitimating political system puts together, or a, a treaty-based system like the ICJ, which again, although the judges will always re retain their independence, their adjudicatory independence, are themselves part of a system in some sense directly financed, administered, regulated by a, a group of states, an identifiable group of states. Um, having said all that, the, the, the means, just as it would be for a national court system, or I know we'll talk later about the ICJ, an international court, trying to bring justice in a more efficient and effective way, of course, should always be a goal of any system, whether it be international, transnational, or national. The, the overriding concept I try to bring or think about in this respect, with respect to international arbitration, is the notion of a collaborative arbitration. That is an arbitration, we sometimes have the debate in these four about you know, who owns the arbitration. Is it the arbitrators or the, you know, the parties? And of course, at the end, the parties own it. And they're the ones who've convened it. But I do think it is the most effective way to do it is to think of it as a collaboration between party, parties, the council, and the arbitrators, in which they are constantly looking, constantly feeding one another for the most effective way to resolve the dispute, the very specific dispute in front of them. And it is the great hallmark, as much as people say it, it happens to be true, the great hallmark of, of international arbitration, that it's flexible. Um, so those preliminary thoughts about the process and the way we should be thinking about this, um, recognizing that we've, we've agreed we're going to do this in very short order. So now we really get more concrete, and I tell you the three things that, in which I, 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 in, in which the points in which I think we could directly, in some fashion, um, affect the process. And, and Devil Voice has put out something called the, the uh, Devil Voice Protocol for Promoting Efficiency. Some of these ideas you'll find there, a few others. The first is how we deal with documents. The great bogey person of international arbitration. Oh my gosh, we're going to have U.S.-style discovery. We might have to give the other party documents. There might be some document exchange. It is, it's absolutely a legitimate fear, but it, it sometimes seems to those of us who are used to it that it's, um, that it's somehow frozen people uh, in, in the face of an inevitable issue. That is, given the way business, individuals and business conduct their lives these days, we generate, think about you know, 10 years ago, how much of your life do you record on paper because of email and the internet compared to what you would have done 10 or 15 years ago? 
Um, and there, and the, how much of, of all of the information for businesses and the like are stored by, by electronic means? Uh, arbitrators and parties are going to have to be comfortable with it. They're going to have to grapple with it. They're going to have to make decisions about it. That's not to say that they can't be strict and disciplined. Indeed, the only way an arbitrator can be strict and disciplined about the kind of document production that might be called for in a particular case, or to be able to decide that no such document production is called for, is by being completely comfortable with the notion of document exchange, when it's useful, when it's useless, and basic techniques of e-discovery. Because if an arbitrator can't even deal with it, they can't fulfill their charge on the one hand to make sure they're running a fair proceeding, but on the other hand to make sure they're running an efficient one. Um, I do think there are other even more basic techniques. Uh, for example, I think many people are now, and it's something I always do when I'm sitting as arbitrator, trying to encourage parties to, um, to produce documentary evidence in two, in two types identify what are your core documents? What do you think the case is really going to turn on? Many times people produce documents that I think of as challenge me documents. They, they are essential to establish certain facts or certain parts of the claim or certain parts of the scenario. But at the end of the day, nobody's ever going to look at them because effectively the facts that they're designed to challenge or to establish are not going to be challenged. And I even put in my, in my orders to say that no inference can be drawn and no argument will be heard about the fact that you thought something was less important because you didn't put it in your core documents, but you later start to argue about it. It's wonderful to get a, a set of filings that's not only on a disk, of course you put everything on a disk, but then just get one set of exhibits that's about you know one, you know, that, that big. Um, it, 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 trial lawyers will tell you all the time that the key documents that actually decide a dispute in any case, no matter how many file drawers it fills up, are actually relatively few. So that's the first, dealing with documents. The second um, uh, technique that I think we need to look much more closely at is the use of legal experts. Um, this may be arrogance on my part, but I do think that uh, as much as international arbitration, like other dispute resolution pr um, pr processes, rely on specific expertise, in an international arbitration, I think legal experts are of a different character than technical or financial or whatever experts. I may not be a Japanese lawyer or a Brazilian lawyer or a Korean lawyer, but I know what a legal text is and I know what different sorts of, legal, of law are. And I, I feel like I am legal expertise is more accessible to me than perhaps some aerospace engineering or the like. And therefore, I think when we have the prospect of legal experts coming in and proving what a particular type of law is, it can very quickly become into a fairly artificial um, process. I also have, a, even though I know that these are opinions, I always have a little bit of trouble um, given the nature of law and the nature of legal argument to someone actually you know, putting up their hands and saying, you know, this is the law in, in when you have frequently disputed issues. And my solution to that is that in, in many cases, we would be better off if good counsel from the particular jurisdiction argued the, the legal issues from that jurisdiction rather than bringing in experts um, uh, who are going to prove it. I, I had this discussion with one, one of my partners, Peter Goldsmith from London. He said, yes, but it's so much fun to cross-examine a legal expert. And, and, but that, I think, partly proves the point. We feel, we feel like we can cross-examine a legal expert just because we know, even if we are not schooled in the nuances of that body of law, we know what legal technique is. And I think we could save a lot of um, time and money sometimes if we, had, if we gave the arbitrators legal, the relevant legal text, but then ha had those issues argued. And then the last, and I'll be very quick about it, is I th one of the great places in which we could achieve greater efficiency is a really careful examination of the various ways you can go about post-hearing proceedings. Um, you know, in this respect, I think the ICC is particularly problematic because, as many of you, you will know, the ICC uh, compensates its arbitrators on the basis of the size of the claim and the amount of time you actually spend on the arbitration. They supposedly take it into account, but it's a relatively small factor. That, of course, has the potential of being an incentive to the arbitrator simply saying, okay, go forth and write these vast, comprehensive post-hearing briefs that can take a lot of time and cause clients a great deal of expense. And I think arbitrators have a real obligation, just as Lucy was talking about making sure you walk into the room prepared, to begin to formulate what you think about a case during the course of, 
course of the case and be able to focus as much as possible the parties on what you really need to hear after the case. There will be some cases that are very large and complicated where you'll have lengthy hearings where you will be bringing in a lot of testimony where there will be a reason uh, there will be, it will be justifiable to have relatively comprehensive post-hearing briefs. But even there, I think where the arbitrator can help is by coming, making sure that he or she understands the case, works with the party to make sure that the post-hearing briefs are going to talk to one another. I have recently taken to the practice of proposing to the parties that the, either the tribunal or the arbitrator of sitting sole um, actually outline the post-hearing briefs, take the initiative of outlining the post-hearing briefs. I'm a, I'm a big believer in the standard cliche that you don't know what you think until you try to write it, and you don't know what you, um, what you know and what you don't know until you've actually tried to outline a dispute. Um, th it's a great, ver a great benefit to the arbitrator, but it can also be a, a real use to the parties in making sure that any post-hearing um, post submissions are directly speaking to one another, directly and squarely confront the same issues. Um, but that should not, e even that technique should not be every case. In many cases, by the time you get to the end of the hearing, the arbitrator, presuming you've, you have appointed them because they you know, have some smarts and practical sense, should know at that point what they really need to hear about, what they really need to know, and how the parties can convey it to them before they make up their minds. So those are my three basic suggestions for how international arbitration itself could make itself more efficient, at the moment could make itself more efficient. Great. Th thank you both, and we'll, we'll have some questions. The, fir the first question I have is uh, for Lucy, but uh, uh, Donald, if you'd weigh in on it as well, and, and it's one of your bugaboos that you raised, and that's the availability of arbitrators. Because, you know, Eve's 48, and David Karen, and Lucy Reed only have so many days in a year. There's 365 days, and you take out weekends, and there's travel time if you're going to, a, if you're going to be in London or Geneva, wherever it's going to be. And, and you've got all these arbitrations, but the problem is the, the list that your clients, the people that your clients feel comfortable with, and are willing to say, okay, I'll, because it is a big dispute, and it's a lot of money involved, whether it's an ICSID case or an AFTA case or an ICC or ICDR case, the, the list is relatively small once you start narrowing it down. And then when you get three of them together, and they have to, to get together and, and put their schedule, you know, it, it becomes almost impossible. And so the, I like the idea of the blackout dates, but if you did the blackout dates, you, you'd, you'd cross a bunch of people off the list and maybe the question is, how do you expand the pool? Because I think there are a lot of people that can do this work. Uh, maybe folks that are only serving as counsel or, or retired judges that, that, that would be good at this, but how do you expand the pool so it's not going back to every single time when I get an email, you know, who in California did you know, and you write back David Karen, or you write back, you know, Lucy Reed, or, or one of the people on your kind of list. How, how do you deal with that scheduling? Because I think that's the biggest, I think that's a bigger problem than any of the procedural issues is actually getting folks in a room, especially for a multi-day hearing. Well, you, you raised a whole bunch of issues in that right. in that question, um, and the one of the reasons I said at the beginning, I think the complaints are exaggerated. Is I often when I actually push, and I wrote a lot about this to the point I was becoming sort of a harpy a few years ago. Um, I pushed corporate counsel, and I said, You're, "You say it's taking too long, but yet you keep picking." The small, from the small handful of international arbitrators who you know, and we tell you, you will have to wait a year for a hearing and two years for an award. And their answer is very honest. It's, if we lose this case, we have to be able to go to our shareholders and say it was in solid hands and we weren't taking a chance on some new arbitrator. So I say, fine, I understand that completely, but stop complaining. Uh, about it. Yep. Uh, in fact, we tend at, at Freshfields, even in bigger cases now, to we look for uh, relatively new arbitrators who are experienced counsel, but if they're new at arbitration, they actually work at it harder and put more attention into it as well as being more available, and we've been very successful uh, in doing that. But at the end of the day, uh, in international arbitration, you've got a system, as everybody knows, who does it here, where the award is almost surely enforceable under the New York Convention without appeal, uh, with assets being attached elsewhere. And we are responsible as counsel with picking the three people who will decide that. And it's not a time to say, gosh, you know, I haven't picked uh, someone from UCLA for a while. Uh, let's do that. It, it really is, 
is quite a calculus. As I don't take, I only sit in one or two arbitrations at a time. It's, it's impossible for someone who is an active counsel in arbitrations in a law firm uh, to be able to take them on. So I come back to what I said, which is at least up front, find out where the, the calendars match, and then make an informed decision with your, your clients about whether they really want that panel, knowing how impossible it will be to get them together. And the other thing is we can, I didn't say this, but a lot of people are saying that we can pay arbitrators more and put incentives that they will be paid more and better if they act uh, more expeditiously. The good American capitalism system we, we could explore. Donald, you must have. Well, you know, lots the ICC of says that they do say that one of the things they take into account is how expeditiously the award is rendered. But I think, you know, since most of the costs are set up front, that it, 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 I think it's a relatively small. Um, I agree with Lucy that you now I, I, I used to wonder. Whether this is just you know reflecting back at myself because I was you know when I was a young you know relatively young arbitration practitioner I always used to think well the right profile of an arbitrator is a young and then I'd realize I was describing myself I don't have to do that anymore um, and, I, and I wouldn't qualify a unfortunately wise exactly senior <laughs> exactly um, but it is a part of a part of a problem um, with expanding the pool. I do think the, the basic idea, though, is transparency. How do we get, I, I think if you had statistics, for example, on how, uh, how long arbitrators took to render awards and how long tribunals took to render awards, it would be very helpful. There may still be cases, though, and we've all had this discussion where you yep. say, you know, I know you want to move this case. This, this arbitrator, for various reasons, um, is the right profile, but he or she is very busy, um, and people will say, yeah, well, that's what we're going to do anyhow. So it is. It is, um, it's, a, it's a hard one to crack. By the way, one of my other unpopular amongst arbitrators over 80 proposal is that they be asked to give data, just as the number of arbitrations that they've decided and their blackout calendars, of how long the time has passed since the close of hearings in their cases and the issuance of the award, with the opportunity to fill in a field that says, well, it was suspended, or my co-arbitrator was sick, or whatever. I, I have no doubt if, it, if those people you're talking about had to see in black and white two years, 18 months, two years, the time would, would come down. It was August in France. Uh, <laughs> questions from the audience? <laughs> it was, uh, it was Sunday morning, I don't know. <laughs> no, uh, I, I was uh, quite impressed by what you said at the beginning, uh, the fact that uh, most of the times arbitration are there because they, they don't, they, the people can, cannot go to a court. So it reminds me of the sports arbitration, where in that case, uh, sporting institution cannot go to the court. So, and what happened there is that progressively arbitration uh, started to resemble like a court, so becoming uh, function, starting functionally as a court. So my question is, if you can say a bit more about that first point, uh, how this circumstance affects the arbitration, not only in terms of bad effect, okay, it's not fast, it's becoming, but also if the, the arbitration itself is assuming another kind of function. Do you want to start that? Well, I guess, I mean, the question, I mean, I think it's, it's not, um, I don't think it's unfair to think of arbitration as effectively a court. It's a different kind of court, but I think the kinds of considerations you're talking about in, as I said a moment ago, in a national court system, in an international court system, in a transnational system like commercial arbitration, are the, the fundamental tension is always going to be the same. You, you want a fair um, system and you want an efficient system, and you're constantly balancing those things. I think the great prospect of international arbitration is that because, and, 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 and particularly with respect to a national court system, a national court system is dealing with a very large number of cases. It's a very wide variety of cases. It has to have a structure which inevitably some cases will have to fit in, so you can't quite mold it. Whereas in an international arbitration, one of the things I do with my students at the point when we start talking about the conduct of the proceedings, I walk them through, you know, the trial model law and the ICC rules and say, you know, how much does this tell you about 
what you have to do. I mean, there's virtually nothing there. Compare this to a code of civil procedure right. in a national court system. Um, and th it's that prospect that allows us to contour the proceeding to the dispute. But the basic tension that you're always dealing with, fairness and efficiency, fairness and efficiency, you're dealing with in one context there for another. And, it, and I agree with you that there is there's a lot of criticism that international arbitration is becoming just like litigation, so why use it anymore compared to going to the courts? So one answer is you can't go to the courts. And the other is it's still, it's not really like, um, like litigation because there aren't the motions practice and there isn't the kind of U.S. full-fledged discovery. But interestingly, in the Italian case that I mentioned to you, in the arbitration agreement, never reviewed by any lawyer on the Italian side, I'm sorry to say, or I'm glad to say, I guess, because it wasn't me, uh, there was a, a provision that every person who might, might be a witness had to be subject to deposition. Uh, and so there were 40 horrified <laughs> Italian engineers and Venezuelan engineers being subject to U.S. style depositions. And the point is the chairman of our arbitral tribunal begged the parties not to do these depositions, and we didn't want to do the depositions, but the Miami litigators on the other side said, oh, this is our lucky day. We're in international arbitration doing depositions. So, so that, that is an area where the bleeding wasn't really helpful uh, for the case. I, I wrote an article on, um, in the Cahiers on dispositive motions, pointing out that dispositive motions were added to the U.S. federal rules at, from the courts of equity in England to shorten court uh, cases, to get issues decided early or on discrete issues of law. And so it's not a bad thing to have dispositive motions. It's in international arbitration. It's not just more U.S.-style litigation uh, being added to it. But the court case, I mean, sorry, the sport cases work pretty well still. Well, they can be fast, too. I mean, at the Olympics, I'll have these arbitrations well, in an afternoon, and uh, I, I have a, a partner who does this, and it's amazing when you talk to her about how quickly they'll, they'll get a dispute, and, and they're huge issues, at least for that moment in time. It's a, you know, whether someone can participate in a race or gets a gold medal or, or those sorts of things, and, and they do uh, proceed with dispatch. Uh, the, the best decision by my partner, Jan Paulson, was with a snowboarder decision where he wrote, <laughs> the whole decision was basically this when he gave the medal back, marijuana is not a performance enhancing <laughs> drug. <laughs> <laughs> All right, any further questions? Well, let me answer that first by saying that's why I think it's so important that the ICC rules are now putting into black and white some of the road signs that will help make these corrections. The ICSID rules allow for dispositive motions, the Singapore rules. So that's going to help a lot to have the institution say, you can do it this way, you must do it this way, because that gives backbone to the arbitrators who are always afraid they'll be challenged for violating due process, or their awards will be challenged for violating due process by not letting it go on for three years. So I think the biggest step is for the institutions to do it. In terms of whether it's respondents or claimants, the stereotype, of course, is that the respondent, whether it's a state or a private party, wants to drag it out and the claimant wants it to go fast. Uh, in fact, as Robert said, I think it's often more mutual because the council are too booked and the arbitrators are too booked. So it, it requires everybody behaving uh, quite a bit better and costs being awarded, real money being put on the table for lack of re reasonable efficiency and, and people not being afraid to talk about it. It also depends, too, very frequently on the posture of the dispute. You know, we've all had the phenomenon of, you know, that the counsel for, I walk into arbitration sometime and say, you know, I'm a New York lawyer, you know, in some respect, in some respects, I don't want any document discovery. And my, you know, civil law opponent who's grown up in a system where there's no such thing says, in order to get justice, we need to have full and expansive document production because given the posture of the case, that is what suits. And of course, you know, arbitrators who, you know, have, have 
you know, prudence and wisdom will figure out what in that circumstance it fits. But none of, I don't think any of this is characteristic. I think many of these things arise in the circumstance of the case and the parties take the positions that serve their interests in that case. And by the way, in fraud cases, of which there are more than there probably should be, including in ICSID right now, document discovery is very, very important uh, when you're dealing with fraud. I think we've got time for one more question in the back. U.S. law in the sense of substantive law or U.S. law? Well, I think, I guess, again, this is obviously speaking generally, but the question is a general one. Certainly, um, I think arbitrators take very seriously the notion that they apply law and they apply the law cho almost always chosen by the parties. The number of cases you'll get where the parties have not chosen law is very rare. And, of course, in treaty cases, um, although there can be issues about the applicable law, and I think in most case, uh, uh, cases it's straightforward. So in terms of the substantive law, I, I don't. I think arbitrators, as I say, take very seriously that they're going to apply um, law, and that would not necessarily be U.S. law. As a matter of procedure, um, you know, the whole when I first started doing arbitration, um, you know, the, the flavor of the, the topic of the month was always you know, harmonization and divergence. Um, people talked a great deal about the, the system and how. You know, the various influences. I do think that the system we have now, and there is there is a, a a a type of arbitration that happens in many different disputes from which one can diverge. But I think major disputes in which includes, for example, cross examination, includes some techniques from civil law systems, um, includes you know, witness statements in lieu of direct testimony, is um, to some extent an an amalgamation of techniques from various legal systems. And I think the, um, the arbitrations that occur where will often be very much influenced by the identity of the parties, the identity of the arbitrators they choose, the legal systems from which they come, the, the, um, the economic systems from which they come. So I'm, I think you know, the notion of US dominance on procedural matters, I think also, I, I think you'd have to justify it. I, I, it's, from my standpoint, the, as, I, as I said earlier, the flexibility of international arbitration and its ability to draw on various legal traditions and various techniques is one of its strengths. Well, thank you all very much. Excellent questions. Uh, Ed, Don, and Lucy, uh, we're indebted to you for your presentations tonight. Uh, a lot of wisdom uh, around the table. So thank you, uh, David. Thanks for convening this uh, meeting. We, it's, it's great to attend an ASIL meeting in Los Angeles as opposed to Washington. So. Uh, thank you for bringing us all together. My pleasure. Perhaps everyone can join me in thanking the panel. So our program will be starting tomorrow morning at UCLA um, campus. I'm sorry. Starting at noon, excuse me. Um, and I'm just wondering, Betsy, the, there is a bus back for those who have come from the hotel. There's a shuttle. Uh, yes. Talk to each other here. All right, so we will be mingling for a while, and uh, thanks again to the panel, and thank all of you. I look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Thank you.